Hello and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 94, bringing on an author and talking with them about one, occasionally more, of their books in detail. I'm Charlie Place, and today I am joined by Elizabeth Fremantle, who is on the podcast for her third time, having already spoken about The Poison Bed in episode 7, and The Honey and the Sting in episode 70. I'm very happy she's back. As you may have guessed by now, I think her books are pretty darn awesome. We'll be talking today about Liz's latest novel, Disobedient, which is about the 17th century Italian woman artist Artemisia Gentileschi and focuses on a formative year of her life when she was 17 years old. If you appreciate content warnings for your media, please do check them for this episode before proceeding. That said and done, hello Liz. Hello, you make me sound fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are, your, your book's fantastic, you're fantastic. You know? <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. <laughs> so, okay, we'll, we'll get into the book, this latest book, very exciting. Why Artemisia and also, I suppose, the general inspiration for this book? Okay, well, Artemisia's story, she's been on my back burner for a long time. And because the novel is set in Rome, you know, I kind of had really only ever written novels set in England in a particular period of about 100 years between 1540 and 1630. You know, Artemisia did come into that timeline, but it was a completely different, slightly off-piste idea for me, and I wasn't really sure how my publishers would go for it. And it was the last book in my contract, and I was meant to be writing another book about an English woman, Afra Ben, restoration playwright, incredible woman. And I just couldn't find the story. Sometimes that happens. And I, I kind of thought, Artemisia is sort of sitting on my back burner. And we were just going into... The first lockdown, so 2020, and um, there was going to be a big exhibition of Artemisia's work in London. And it had been very much on my radar. I was really excited about it. And of course, it was postponed because of COVID. And there had been lots of articles. I kept hearing about her on the radio for publicity for this exhibition. And it was as if she started speaking to me. And I thought, OK, I can't ignore this. This is a story I want to write, but for me, it's a very, very personal story. It's uh, Artemisia is a survivor of sexual abuse, and the story is quite close to my own personal story. So I'd slightly shied away from it because I wasn't sure the extent to which I could cope with living with her story for the length of time it takes to write a novel. I mean, you really, really have to develop this incredibly close relationship to your characters. And I think that was one of the reasons why I'd not really considered it before, but she kept coming back to me. And I thought, okay, it's obviously my unconscious is telling me this is the moment to write this novel. And this is yours, yours for the taking. So got in touch with my editor who was keen and it went from there, but she'd been around in my mind for a long time. I'd first seen her painting of Judith slaying Holofernes and been completely struck dumb by its wild, furious take on a biblical scene. It's a really, really brutally violent depiction of a woman beheading, or two women beheading a, a man. Is a biblical story. There's a lot of violence in the Bible. But it was astonishing that it came from a female painter. And that was what initially intrigued me about her. Yeah. So that's sort of how I came to write about her. I struggled looking at that painting because you're right. I mean, especially I think with the information that you include in your prose and also the translations you've got, which I'm going to ask you about soon. Um, yeah, goodness, I struggled with that painting. But can you give us like a general overview of her work? Oh, sure. I mean, as a female to be a painter at that time. I mean, there were other women painters, very, very few. There were a couple of very accomplished portrait painters from that period, from slightly earlier even. So it wasn't as if she was the first female painter, but she was the first woman to tackle those kind of subjects 
they were not portraits. They were these really visceral biblical subjects in which she tended to always center the female. And in a way, what she was doing was de-eroticizing the, the female in art. All those women, you know, naked women in, in art, it was all in a sense for the male gaze. There was no sense of what those women were going through. This is what you see over and over again in Artemisia's work. The female in society, in Roman society of that period, so 1611 in Rome, these are the experiences she's having. You know, she's got sort of creepy men ogling her if she goes out in the street alone without a chaperone. She's dealing with those experiences and she's using the biblical stories to tell, in a sense, the story of women and how women how women have to behave. And then by the time she comes to paint later on in the same year, possibly a little bit later, but we're not sure of the dates of some of her paintings, the exact dates, she painted two depictions of Judith slaying Holofernes. And the man is completely emasculated and terrified. And no one had painted that no one other than Caravaggio had tackled that aspect of that story. It's such a bold and courageous choice for her as a painter, as a young female painter who wants to be taken seriously. And of course, this is a supreme challenge and the obstacles that come her way as a result of her desire to kind of operate as a man in a man's world. She set the bar really, really high for herself and she does achieve her dream, which is to be judged alongside her male peers. She doesn't want to be seen to be a good painter, a good woman painter. She wants to be seen as a good painter and she achieves that, which is extraordinary, really. Well, you say that, you say about her achieving it. Do you mean in her lifetime as well? You know, was she successful during her life? She was extremely successful during her life. And though my novel covers just this year, it's a year of extreme difficulty and obstacles that really, really challenge her. Most other women would be crushed by the experiences she went through just to achieve what she achieved. Then after the end of my novel, she moves to Florence and she paints for the Medici family. They commissioned several works from her. So she really established herself as one of the great painters of her day. She was the first woman to be admitted to the Academy of Arts in Florence, which is a huge accolade for her. And yes, she was very, very well respected in her time, very prolific. She traveled all over Europe. She came to England and painted for the court of Charles I and Henrietta Maria. There are a couple of pictures still in the collection. There's a very, very good self-portrait, but it's been in the news recently. Another Susanna and the elders, actually, that was sort of discovered languishing in a basement at the Royal Collection, misattributed as simply French school. And it has been cleaned and reattributed to Artemisia, which is amazing. I mean, it's amazing to see a piece of work reemerge that's hers. That was a really incredible moment, actually. So, she, yes, she came to England. She travelled to Naples. She travelled all over Italy. And she was a huge success. But I think what happened was Baroque painting went kind of went out of fashion with the Enlightenment and... Then when Baroque painters, people were re revisiting them in the Victorian period, she was a female painter. No one was interested in even considering her work. So she wasn't really rediscovered until probably the 1970s when a feminist art historian started to look at her work again. And from there, I think in the late 80s, early 90s, Mary Garrard, an art historian, wrote a very, very good book which was sort of biographical, but it looked at her biography and all her work, alongside all her work, really. And since then, there's been a sort of a slow resurgence of female artists, and Artemisia has 
been one of the primary figures in that movement. I wish she was a household name. I believe she's as good a painter as Caravaggio, and I believe people should all know her. Anyway, I hope my novel will help to change, help to give her the fame she deserves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, certainly. I I think it will, yeah. I knew about the resurgence of of interest in, in her work and her, but I didn't realise it had taken until so late as the 1970s. Yeah, you've, you've surprised me there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were one or two people, I think somebody wrote about her in the 1930s. She was sort of, I think, considered a bit of a curiosity rather than a serious, a serious artist. Yeah. So can you tell us her father, Orazio, I think it would be pronounced? Yeah. I wasn't sure what to make of him until later on, and then you start to get an idea of who he is and what he's about. Can you tell us how much your fictionalization, I suppose, aligns with how Orazio treated her in general? Well, I think what we do know about Orazio was he, he was a painter and he wasn't quite as good a painter as his daughter. Mm. So for me, that was the kind of first kernel of characterization of him is, okay, Artemisia's mother died when she was 12, I think. So he had four children, Artemisia the eldest, and there were three brothers. And so he had to raise four children alone. And artists were not rich people. They were jobbing, it was work, it would come and go, sort of feast and famine. And I tried to think about that, that he taught her to paint, so he would have been incredibly proud of the painter she became and the talent she was obviously showing at such a young age. But on the other hand, I kind of thought, how would he feel about that as a painter himself? And and I thought, he's going to be jealous. There's got to be a level of envy. And then I also thought about this idea of, you know, that she's a woman and women didn't become painters, not that kind of painter. And I wanted him to have all these mixed feelings about her, that his sons didn't have the talent. Why did God give all the talent to his daughter? You know, it's as if he felt God was mocking him in some ways. And so he is a complex character, but obviously much of his characterization is generated from these few small facts we have about him and that we can see his art, but he doesn't convey the kind of visceral emotion that she does in her work is very beautifully done, his work, but it doesn't make you feel that much. It just makes you think that's a beautiful picture. That was really my starting point for his character. And we do know that he is the one who, I mean, no spoiler, but there's a big court case because after the rape and for one reason or another, the father would expect to restore the family honour, the honour of the Gentileschi's. This man, Tassi, has deflowered his daughter. He wants reparation, and the reparation is she has to marry her, her rapist. That was quite normal practice at the time. And we know that Orazio pushed for that. And then, for one reason or another, I don't want to give away the plot, it comes to a court case, and... um In order to restore the family honour, Orazio is prepared to see his daughter go through the most appalling circumstances of this court case. Not only have her name absolutely dragged through the mud, I mean, really, really, she was really vilified, but also undergo some, uh, you know, really appalling things during the trial. And he still insisted upon that, the reparation of the family honour. That was his primary, primary desire, rather than the well-being of his daughter. And so that also told me a lot about him as a character. But we know so little about him. What we do have is all the testimony from the trial. So all the witnesses and their witness statements, which are all slightly different, and particularly on Tassie's side, they all completely different. He was manifestly making up his stories about what did and didn't happen. But we get a sense of Orazio through that, but not that much. He's a little bit of a shadowy figure in her story. And that's the job of 
the novelist to put meat on the bones of what we know, which is so little. Mm -hmm. You have Artemisia doing little details for her father's paintings. I think we can say objectively, I, I dare say we can say objectively, that yeah, his paintings aren't as detailed as Artemisia's. There's definitely a level of talent that he hasn't got that she has. Do we know of sections of his paintings that were done by other people or, or her? Is that something that we know? Well, we know that painting was a family business. So all the brothers would have been mixing pigments, helping out. They'd have all been working in the studio for their father and that artists' paintings at that time were collaborative. So there'd be parts of paintings that would be given to the assistants to paint who were learning their craft and Artemisia was learning her craft under her father. So we can safely say she was working on some of those. And some of his paintings have been reattributed more recently to her. The whole thing? Yeah, I think there are one or two that have. So we can safely say that there were collaborative projects because that was how art in that period in Rome, how artists worked. The artist would come in and do the kind of hands and face and then he'd like hand over all the other bits to assistants and people. So we can pretty safely say that some of his works would have been painted by her, bits of them. Mm. No, fair, fair enough. So I'm going to try this Stiatesi family, the family yes. that Artemisia marries into. And it seems that you have got one of their members as Artemisia's friend. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about this family, I suppose, and also what's known about Artemisia's husband? Okay, well, not an awful lot is the truth of that. But the Stiatesi family were great friends of the Gentileschi's and there was a husband and wife, Portia, and um, I can't remember his name now. I can't either. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> it's just Stiatesi. <laughs> Oh, dear, that's terrible. Forget the names of my characters. Um, and they are old friends, and we know that they had connections because they testify in the court case. We see the relationship that the Stiatesi family have with, with the Gentileschi family through the testimonies in the court case. And then Piero, I call him Piero, he's Pier Antonio Stiatesi, who was either the brother or the nephew, nobody really knows, of um, the Stiatesis, who lived in Florence. He is the man she eventually marries. And we know almost nothing about him, but I thought it was very important to create him as a presence and a character in the novel because, because she she marries him eventually. So I felt it was important to kind of build up his character so he becomes a real presence. Otherwise, she's going to a very unknown future. And I wanted her to go to a future that was positive, really, because of what she goes through. And I, th I felt like looking at what happened later on in their marriage, there are lots of letters that were discovered but not that long ago and they really chart her later life and her contracts for paintings and things and making sure everybody's getting paid properly. And he's part of her world in that time, but they seem to live this kind of interestingly open marriage. I mean, she lived almost the life of a libertine. She had a very unconventional way of living. She had a lover who she corresponded with, who was her lover for about 13 years, Marenghi. And he was also corresponding with her husband. They were friends. So that led me to wonder about the nature of their marriage. And so I made Piero is, uh, he's a homosexual, yet they're soulmates. And so it's a really, really deep friendship that's beneficial for both of them. And in a way, by being able to marry one another, they both get the kind of veil of respectability that marriage gives them both, but they get to live the kind of life they want. So that's how he emerged as a character. That's really, really fascinating to hear about that. And I've read 
the Wikipedia page. I've read other things about Artemisia. And yeah, there's just nothing I could find. The lady that you call Zeta, she has another name. Can you tell us about her, I suppose, in the context of your book and also in history? Because it looks like there's not so much known about her. No, there's not an awful lot known about her, but we, she does play a really pivotal part in Artemisia's story. She's called Tutsia, but I changed her name to Zeta really because I always want to make the reading experience very smooth for readers so they don't have to kind of think, who is that character? And I already have Tassi as a name, T-A-S-S-I. It's short, it begins with T, and Tutsia, short, beginning with T. I, I just didn't want any confusion between those. So I gave her a kind of nickname, Zeta. And we know she lived with the Gentileschi family as a sort of chaperone figure. Artemisia had reached this age where, or perhaps Orazio felt that he needed a woman around the house because he needed someone to keep an eye on his daughter as she was reaching an age where she might become an object of interest to men. And not necessarily in a good way. So Zita was part of the household and she stayed in the household and she was also arrested in the run-up to the trial. So these are all things that I've put into the novel. She was accused of basically procuring Artemisia for men and basically running a kind of mini brothel. That's why she was arrested and She's a completely different kind of woman from uh, Artemisia. Artemisia comes over as very androgynous, very independent. She doesn't care about her appearance. Whereas Zeta is an artist's model. She's really staggeringly beautiful. And she has always been regarded on in the terms of her own beauty. She doesn't really have a life outside of that. So she's sort of very religious when it suits her. And she's not the brightest button in the box. She's sweet and means well, but she does terrible things without realising. And so, yeah, I wanted to have that contrast between the two women. And so that's why I characterise her, because we don't really know what she was like. We have those few facts about her that put her in the household for that period of time. That's all, really. Okay, all right, yeah. So I'll ask a, a different question. Yeah, I, th- I think you've definitely answered that one fully. The fragments of the book, then, that you use, these translations, they seem to me from the Bible. I looked up the exact translations because I didn't know if you'd created it or if they were real. Can you tell us about these and your use of them? And Are, are they real? Okay, the fragments. Mm. They are not real. I wrote them. I made them up entirely. And actually, it's E. F. Lamenta is, a, is an anagram of my name. <laughs> So it's my was a little joke, but I wanted to have, I wanted to find a way to describe the biblical paintings, the story of Judith and Holofernes. Nobody really knows it nowadays, but I felt it was important for the reader to know the story. So that's why I kind of thought, okay, I'm going to imagine up these fragments, these found fragments of medieval poems in which they describe. And then I have this, this person I invented called E.F. Lamenter who has translated them and who has also translated a kind of song of the saints, a sort of roll call of the female saints. The female saints kind of come into the story towards the end because it becomes all about sacrifice. So, yeah, they, I just thought they would add some texture and allow allow me to tell those stories in a way that was kind of intriguing and wouldn't take the reader too much out of the story itself. Oh, no, fair enough. Uh, yeah, I, I thought they were great. I thought they were a good inclusion. However, if I don't understand anything from your next novels, I'm definitely going to do some checking out, see if there's an anagram or something that I'm missing there. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> kind of feels so obvious now. I'm like, yeah, I probably should have seen that. No, Nobody's yeah. noticed. Nobody, apart from my brother. He's like a crossword whiz, so he's really good at anagrams. So <laughs> at my book launch, he was flicking through the book and he just texted me. I was at the other side of the place to him. And he texted me, EF Lamenter, ha, ha, ha. And he was the, <laughs> the, uh, he's the only person that's, that's noticed that so far. And you're the only person that's asked me about those fragments, actually. 
are you okay with potentially loads of people knowing now because we're of talking course. about yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> of course, absolutely. No, and I like that because it's sort of like a little puzzle in the book, which is kind of fun for people. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. And I think it's quite good then that you've got these bits where it says, oh, uh, what is it? Um, Some text ineligible. That's yeah. it, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, because I wanted to give it a sort of an authentic feel, you know, because it's, it's, it's pastiche of medieval fragments, really. Yeah, well, well you fooled me. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, I'll, I'll ask a couple more questions that are kind of potentially more uh, light, I suppose. And there's no pun intended in that phrase I've just used, considering what I'm about, I'm about to say. There's a lot about laundry lines and the light it stops coming through the window, the whiteness of it, women washing in the riverbank, etc. This seemed like an important element to me, was it? Well, I think, you know, laundry is associated with women always yeah so there was that initially the image came to me I wanted to kind of convey the Via della Croce where they move to from there's the Via Marguta which is where they are at the beginning and they have to move from there because they can't afford to live there anymore and Via Marguta is really kind of really beautiful street and the Via della Croce is sort of busier narrower and it's not quite so nice and it's quite narrow and I envisage these strings of laundry suspended across the street that you do see. I think I'd seen them somewhere like in the past. It's one of the things I've got in my stored image bank or my impressions bank. And somewhere like Siena, I think I'd seen that and I thought, oh, that's amazing. And so that kind of came back to me. I thought they moved to this place. And I think it became a sort of bone of contention between Orazio and Artemisia, this idea, because Artemisia wanted to paint in the way Caravaggio painted, which is all to do with kind of a limited light source and things emerging from the darkness. And that was his calling card, if you will. And she very much paints in that way. And certainly her her Judas slaying Holofernes is very much of that ilk. And so for her, this filtered light that comes in, filtered through the laundry, it suits her and it suits the way she wants to paint. But Orazio is really frustrated. He hates it because for him, it just symbolises a place that's a less salubrious place for them to live and you know he can't see properly to paint and it's a frustration for him whereas for her it's something that will that strikes up her imagination whereas it tampers down his imagination and so that is essentially the movement of the plot is his career is on the wane and hers is just emerging and growing Mm -hmm. the nightingale yeah what's up with that Okay, so the nightingales is a little symbol that runs all the way through. And actually, there was much more of it. One of my source materials is there's a story in Ovid's Metamorphoses, the story of Philomel and Procne. And it's a really, a really brutal story. Philomel and Procne are princesses in ancient Greece, I suppose. I don't know, and in the ancient world. And... uh, Tereus arrives to marry Procne and he takes her off to his kingdom. But Philomel desperately misses her sister. And when Tereus comes back to visit, she begs to be taken back to visit her sister with him. But instead of taking her back, he rapes her, locks her up in a place in the woods. And when she says she's going to shout from the rooftops what's happened, he cuts her tongue out. And actually, it's a story I I return to quite a lot in my work because I feel like it really articulates so much of the situation of women, the way women are silenced. And so that mythological story, you know, I felt like there's an attempt to silence Artemisia through rape and marriage. And so I had much, much more of this 
Ovid story running through as a thread, but actually it didn't really make it into the final draft. It was too tricksy. It didn't really need to be there. But what stayed is the nightingale and the story of Philomel is turned into a nightingale and she sings in the woods. So she gets her voice back in a way. It's a story of a brutal story of triumph, as is Artemisia's, a brutal story of a great triumph. So she's there, Philomel is there in the nightingale and she sort of reappears right at the end, the little bird. So it's just a little symbol that's a kind of personal one for me, really. I'm seeing lots of extra layers in there as well that you've got in there that is in the subtext of what you've just said there, actually. I'm trying to think if it was in your book or someone else's, but is Ovid a favourite author of Artemisia's in your book? Uh, No, but it's uh, Piero who talks about Ovid. She can't read or write, which is a pivotal plot point as well. And we know that she couldn't read or write and she taught herself or she will have been taught later on in life because she became a prolific letter writer. But at the time of the trial, she couldn't write or read. But she really, you know, she's really fascinated. She wants to see everything. She wants to learn everything and know everything so she can paint the whole world, and yet she feels she's not allowed to see most of it. And so, yeah, that's why I've brought Ovid in. Fair enough. You also bring in, I'm going to try and say this name, Beatrice Sensi. Oh, Beatrice Cenci. (laughs) That's the Italian (laughs) pronunciation. But yes, it's spelt same as Beatrice, we pronounce it here. And Cenci, yeah, yeah. I suppose if we talk about her more in this case, why was it important to bring her in? Okay, well, spoiler alert, I am right now uh, presently writing a novel about Beatrice Cenci, that she's the subject of my new novel. Beatrice Cenci is a woman who's executed for murder. And I found in this book about Rome and the history of Rome that Caravaggio attended the execution. Executions in those days were public entertainment, And actually, Beatrice had become a kind of public cause. Everybody thought she should be pardoned because her circumstances were extenuating. That's another story. I'm sure we'll we'll have a chance to talk about that in the future, at some future point. But it's said, I mean, it's anecdotal, but it's said that Caravaggio and Orazio went together and they took Artemisia to see this execution. And she was age six. And I had had a different beginning to the story I had had a beginning that was really focused on Orazio and his big confessions, you know, and his guilt about his envy and everything. And and I sort of thought, hang on a minute, this is a story about Artemisia and I'm all focused on Orazio here. It wasn't well balanced in a way. And But I thought, what do I want? I want a beginning that really demonstrates the jeopardy of women's lives. And what better way than to give her this experience of seeing this woman who has transgressed the social boundaries in some way or other, and she's paying the ultimate price. So that was why I put that scene. I thought it also allowed me to bring in the relate the family relationship between the Gentileschis and Caravaggio, who was someone who was a household friend and uh, contemporary of Orazio's. So I wanted a way to bring that in that wasn't too heavy handed or through too many flashbacks. I had a lot of flashbacks bringing him in and it, it sort of slowed the story down. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have this scene at the beginning and it helps us see her at the moment before her mother's died. She's living in, in this sort of warm family with a, the love of a mother. And this man, this extraordinary man, is having also a pivotal moment because it's it's said that his depiction of Judas slaying Holofernes was inspired by seeing Beatrice Cenci executed. So I just thought there was something really neat about that and how well it introduced her story in terms of the history of that painting in a way. And then she sees Caravaggio's painting and, and she has a lot to say about it actually. <laughs> I know obviously you can't be too detailed as we are being more so with Disobedient, but what can you tell us about this book? Okay, well, I'm not going to tell very much because it's not written yet. (laughs) 
But thematically, I mean, I'm coming back to my familiar themes, a woman pushing against the patriarchy. She's a noble woman, and so she has a different kind of life to Artemisia. But her father is very tyrannical. And so, again, we have this struggle between a father and daughter, but it's in a very different way. And actually, it's a love story, but it's a very, very dark and tragic love story. Sure. I'm going to look forward to seeing what you do with the story there. So I've spoken to you like, I think this is the fourth time overall I've spoken to you. And I know I've spoken about this before, the way that you hone in on things. I'm finally starting to be able to put into words, I think, the defining element of your writing that I'm seeing here kind of thing. You're honing in on one, two things at the exclusion of all else. And yet somehow, I don't know how you do it, you are the the master at it, yet creating a, a fully vibrant world, basically, regardless of honing in, which is amazing. But I suppose I want to ask, Do you think you'll continue to write in this way or might you pull back, I suppose, at some point to look at wider angles? Oh, gosh, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I think my novels become increasingly intensely focused. Yes, I would agree. Because when I think about Queen's Gambit, which is my first novel that I had published, which is about Catherine Parr, and I have been doing a new edit of it fairly recently so I've revisited it I mean it's just a tidy edit it's not a completely different novel or anything because there's a film coming out about it which will be called Firebrand because the title Queen's Gambit got kind of pulled out from under us really Um, so I returned to that novel and I was quite surprised actually at how much my focus has become more and more on one individual character and the building up of that character. Whereas with Catherine Parr, it was really, really about Catherine Parr, but I have these other stories that have a kind of importance of their own within it. And and it's about the wider political situation. Whereas I think what's happened is there's been a kind of distillation of my core themes It's almost as if I go over those themes again and again through different women's lives and they've become increasingly distilled. So with Artemisia, it's distilled into one this very short time span. The novel just covers one year and that's unusual for me. It's as if almost everything's becoming purer and purer in my mind. And in fact, the new novel, it doesn't even have a name yet, but... uh, I'm writing it just from one single perspective. And that's something I've never done before. So, yeah, I don't know. You know, maybe there comes a point where I think, okay, I I cannot go any further in. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I hone in on these characters and they lead me to the story and the way the story will be told. And it has to be very, very personal to me. So I don't know. I can't really answer that question of yours, really. I mean, those themes, those preoccupations of mine, I sort of thought, gosh, I wonder if I could write a novel set in a war novel, for example, a novel set in the First or Second World War. And certainly not at the moment, because I'm still right in with these women fighting against the patriarchy when the stakes were so high for them. You know, I think that's the thing that interests me about that period is you step outside the boundaries and basically your life's not worth living or you lose your life. So the jeopardy is very, very high for those those women. And, you know, there are still women in society who who are punished in those ways for transgressing the rules of their particular societies. I've got a, another novel I'm contracted with this Beatrice one and another one, which is also another early modern one, which is slightly different. It's set around a famous Elizabethan murder. But more than that, I'm not really allowed to say. So I think that might be a little bit less intensely focused because it's going to be more whodunity. But I think I can only write in the way I write. And, you know, I sometimes will set out to do something and I think in my head it's going to be like a whodunit. And it ends up being not like that at all and much, much more intense and all about the the female character <laughs> and the trials and tribulations. 
Well, I'm glad I've heard about this potential war novel because, yeah, you say that. I'm a like, goodness, that's very different. I'm going to need to take some time to get my head around Elizabeth Fremantle writing a war novel. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, it was from the perspective of the women. You know, I didn't yes. think I would ever write a novel with a male protagonist. I mean, I have written one. It was a failure. It was, it was never published. So I don't know. I mean, it might be an interesting exercise, but I can't see myself doing that. It wouldn't be in the trenches type novel if I were to write a war novel. But I think I've been very, very deeply affected by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and reading testimonies of the suffering of women and children primarily. That's ignited something in me. So that's where that comes from. Okay. I want to ask you about your dog, Lola, who is mentioned at the start of your book, I believe. Would you mind telling us about her? Okay, well, my little Lola, she died when I was writing the novel. So I put her in, I do put dogs in novels and my editor's dog died when I was writing Sisters of Treason and I put her dog in that novel. And so I put real dogs in my books because I'm a massive dog person. And so I put Lola in, she's in towards the end actually. She's the Steatessis dog and she is a great comfort to Artemisia when she's awaiting the trial. And yeah, I just wanted to immortalise my little dog. <laughs> that was lovely. Really, really lovely to see. Firebrand then, you have mentioned it and I know I've been waiting for it, yeah, for a long time as well. You told me about it, it was several years ago, so I've been looking forward to it going to get you to tell us when it's happening because there is a date now there is more or less a date so it premiered at Cannes so that's just one screening of it and at the festival and then because of the actors and writers strike it's kind of thrown everything up so actually it's delayed the release the cinema release which will happen 2024 it's going to have its US premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival in June, and it will be released in cinemas either just before that or just after that in the UK and the US. Very exciting. Can't wait to see it. It's going to be good. All right. So, Liz, yeah, it's been wonderful having you again. I'll cross my fingers that you haven't got sick of me and you'll come back next time for the next book. Really enjoy talking to you. Yes, thank you for being here and thank you for Disobedient. That's my great pleasure. It's always a pleasure to come and talk to you, Charlie. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Do join me next time. And if you have a moment to spare, please do leave a rating and or review of this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Podcast Addict. Thank you. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 94, was recorded on the 24th of October, 2023 and published on the 25th of March, 2024. Music and production by Charlie Place.